Okay. Quick introduction. Please help me welcome our guest for the afternoon, Joss Bland Hawthorne, Director of the Sydney Institute for Astronomy and the ARC Laureate Fellow Professor of Physics in the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. He earned a degree in computer science, mathematics, and physics <clears throat> at the University of Birmingham before completing his PhD in astrophysics and astronomy at the University of Sussex and the Royal Greenwich Observatory in 18, in, yeah, 18, okay, in 1986. Professor Bland Hawthorne has made important contributions to both astrophysics and instrumentation. He has taught at universities around the world, including Rice University, University of Oxford, and UC Berkeley. He is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Science and the Optical Society of America, and a great many other things as well. According to ResearchGate, Professor Bland Hawthorne <clears throat> has authored or co-authored more than 1,000 scholarly articles that have been cited more than 53,000 times. <laughs> well, Josh, welcome and thank you again. Welcome to the Greenway Talks online. We'll take questions at the end. You can type questions into the chat as we go along. But for that reason right now, I'll ask everyone in our Zoom audience to turn off their microphones. And with that, Joss, please, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be back a year later. It was a land of fires when I last spoke to you, and now it's the land of floods. So it really is very biblical. Even today, if I turned my computer around, you'd see tropical trees like a rainforest and just floods of rain everywhere. <laughs> anyway, it's just uh, just it's breakfast time here to give you a sense of uh, proportion Sunday morning. And uh, it's really terrific to be back online with you all. OK, so uh, let me try to share my screen and get going. It's a good story. and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if I go into display mode, um, here we go, display mode. And can someone tell, oh yeah, it's the wrong view. Let me just switch the view. Um, swap displays. Do you see a single slide? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so let me move on then. Um, thank you. So I don't want to get into the history of uh, who were the first astronomers, but there's a case to be made that our Aboriginal people of Australia were possibly the first. Um, they've been on this land for um 60,000 years and uh, there are people that will tell you that their drawings would pick out parts of the milky way um maybe not pointing out star groups but pointing out clouds in the milky way because we have spectacular views down here of the of the galactic center and the the dust lanes so anyway um i like to start normally when i give talks in australia i start by acknowledging uh, the original astronomers possibly the aboriginal people of australia certainly long before egypt the Incas, Aztecs, and so forth. Okay, so here's a picture of Sydney Harbour. Um, um, the ill-fated Captain Cook went sailing past the entrance to the harbour, ended up a, a swamp down here, which is our modern airport, Botany Bay, uh, but missed this glorious harbour. And I live, where I'm speaking to you right now is from here, Bar Balmoral Beach. This is where I am, literally right there. So if I was to get on my kayak, I could, sort of, I could kayak out and through the heads in about half an hour from here. Okay, so my reason for showing you this, you have this North Shore where I live and the South Shore um, of the harbour, and these are the heads, South Head and North Head. There was an observatory built uh, in here up on this reserve, and if I wasn't giving this talk, I'd be playing a soccer match on that field right now. Uh, so it's anyway, it's a pleasure, more of a pleasure to speak to you than to, to be playing in a game where we'd get beaten, I'm sure. So if I was to show you what happened on that headland, uh, in 1940s and early 50s, um, there was a very odd department at that time in 19, uh, 1950, let's say, uh, University of Sydney was very small. There were just a few, there were very few professors in those days and very few astronomers. 
Um, and two enterprising astronomers um, went down to the local uh, shipping company and asked for all their old straps, metal straps that they were using for millions of boxes to, to pack up. Remember, we used to have the old wooden crates and you put metal straps around. And they figured out that those metal straps actually could be used to build a telescope. And they quite literally uh, got thousands of these metal straps for free uh, from the local tip, as it were, the, at, the, at the shipping company, and built up this structure. They dug a hole in the ground, and then they built this receiver up here and put it on poles. And then they turned this whole structure, which cost them, I think, $200, into one of the first uh, ever radio telescopes that did something scientifically useful. Uh, of course, it goes back to in, in the US as people who built similar structures in Netherlands back in the 1930s and 40s. But um, but this was a particularly interesting device because um, they had a suspicion that they would be able to see what we now know as the center of the galaxy. So this is really important to know where is the center of our galaxy. And this is the map that they published. Um, see if I can. Uh, hang on. Here we go. This is the map they published in 1954 in nature and it shows where the radio emission continuum emission is strongest and notice that it, they, you, they see the milky way as a sort of a, a strong source of uh, ionized it's, what it is is basically ionized gas ionized by by star forming regions and so forth and then supernovae and other things and they found this nice milky way in radio emission but it had a very bright center now today we know a lot more about it than they did but that bright, that very bright radio center is what was recognized as the galactic center that year. Look how far off it is in terms of coordinates. You know that zero or 360 is what we call the center of the galaxy in galactic longitude. And look where this is. It's at 329 degrees. So we are basically 30 degrees away. The galactic center framework was 30 degrees out, which is an enormous error. Um, it was certainly, and of course, it was because it was determined by northern radio astronomers, people who were not in the southern hemisphere. And this thing goes right over Sydney every day. So it was the best place to look would be in Sydney, which is the reason behind their little telescope. Anyway, so this was the beginning of the story in a sense, which is where is the galactic center? And the galactic center, uh, as I say, goes right over Sydney, and we now know its position to incredible accuracy because it's uh, the home of a supermassive black hole. But knowing where your framework is centered and what is the framework, like how far away is that center, is the first part of any story, like figuring out where you are, where you live and what's going on around you. All right, so this is a modern picture um, taken, I think maybe from the, probably from the uh, middle of Australia somewhere. Um, and, if, if you uh, X marks the spot, as they say, and we live right in there, that's the Sagittarius constellation. And this rather beautiful collage, uh, you can pick out star forming regions, uh, nebulae of different de descriptions. Most of the brown stuff, as you probably know, is dust very local to us. I mean, the center of the galaxy is, is 20, 28,000 light years away, but this stuff is probably only a few hundred light years away, a lot of this stuff, which is high off the plane. Uh, but you sort of have to look through waves and layers of uh, of cloud to go all the way into the center. And that center is only visible in the infrared and beyond. You can't see it in the optical because there's many magnitudes of extinction. Okay, so um, let me try to get this going. My cursor is playing up at the moment. All right, so this is a, a modern artist's impression uh, of the Milky Way. And I'm going to say now, which I haven't had a chance to talk about at conferences yet. We really do not know what the Milky Way looks like. Um, we thought we did, but we don't. Um, there's all sorts of new data coming out to show that the way we join up the spiral arms is completely wrong. And that's been a story going on for 50, 60, 70 years. And we have a meeting coming up in the Netherlands in February, 25 of us are meeting to discuss all these new results to try and make sense of what the Milky Way looks like. So it's not anywhere near as well organized and dramatic as you see here. I think it's a Milky Way is, a, is actually a complete mess. If you could see it from above, it's not it's one of these spectacular, clean spiral arm systems. The spiral arms, I think, are a lot messier than we think. Anyway, so that's a whole other story. Anyway, here's an artist's conception, and we're looking to here we are in the in the in the um, uh, suburbs, looking towards downtown. Um, this is a very dense region of stars. There's a stellar bar pointing almost at us, not quite 20 degrees away from our line of sight. 
Um, and not surprisingly, we can look off in all directions. We can look through the center. We can look perpendicular to the center direction. We can look at 45. We can look all around us. And we, in fact, if we, as long as we can figure out where the stars are in, as, in terms of distance around us, we can do the kind of thing you do with iPhone. You know, with an iPhone, you're sort of standing in one place and you use the uh, panorama mode and you hold it up, up the camera and you sort of do this this way and you go all the way around and eventually it runs out. And then you get this image, this rolling image uh, covering, well, I suppose you can get to 360 degrees if you move fast enough. Um, and that sort of iPhone approach to so this 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 jetty is actually a straight line, uh, and it looks curved only because of the way that we've moved the camera with respect to the the scene in front of us. So in fact, if that was actually a, a straight image uh, with removing the uh, projection, then that would just be a straight line. That, that that this and that is one straight path. Okay, so we can do the same trick with stars. We can stand we can be stand at the sun. We look all around us, counting stars, stars of known distance, all the way around us. And then we can reconstruct how it would look uh, as a three-dimensional object. And this is what we get. This is the two-mass survey. That was in the US, a small infrared telescope counting stars. And, 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 and it had a very crude way of figuring out how far the way the stars were. So this is not a photograph. This is actually, this is actually a re, this is a um, pointillism. It's made up of millions and millions or billions of dots. And when you put all those dots together, you physically see the uh, Milky Way. You see it even flares a little bit as you look along the disk. You see the central bulge. Um, and uh, you see all the effects of extinction because of all the dust that resides in the Milky Way. Now, um, that was done by uh, um, a student of mine. Sorry, that's a zoom in now, showing you these rather beautiful dust lanes. Some of these dust lanes are where the stars are being born. Some of these dust lanes are being swept up by supernova explosions. There's a whole bunch of reasons why that dust is even there at all. So this was done by um, a student I worked with, Melissa Ness. She's now on the faculty at uh, Columbia. She's Australian, and uh, she's now a US uh, professor of astronomy. Wonderful individual. She came back from industry into astronomy and wanted to do something really interesting. So she did the same experiment again in the mid-infrared using the WISE satellite. Um, and again, she was able to you know, have some idea of how far away the stars were from their colors and from their brightnesses. Uh, and then she did a reconstruction of what the Milky Way looks like. Now, I like this one because it shows you how thin the Milky Way is as you go through the center of the galaxy. You know, people have talked about the Milky Way is a total mess. And, you know, but the dust, you see that previous image I showed you, let's see if I can go back to it. That previous image is distracting because there's lots of dust near us. Uh, and not, it's not dust, which is very far away. But this next image in the mid-infrared gets rid of that nearby dust. You're seeing through it in the mid-infrared. And it just shows you the central galaxy. And you see how beautifully thin that Milky Way plane is. That's a really important constraint, actually. That tells you something very interesting about the long history of our Milky Way in terms of billions of years, which I'll get to. All right, so can we reliably construct, reconstruct the Milky Way in 3D? And and I'm equally guilty of this. I've written reviews. 2016, I have a, a review in the Astrophysics Journal. Uh, it's called the Annual, Annual Reviews of Astronomy Astrophysics. It has a high impact. It was written before the Gaia satellite, so we could capture uh, what the Milky Way was. It's become the standard reference of what is the Milky Way. Uh, I think uh, as of recently, I had, I had sort of 1,500 citations or something. So it really has been accepted. It's by myself and someone called Otto and Gerhard. It's been accepted as sort of, sort of a, an inventory of what is the Milky Way? What does it look like? What's it made of? What are the structural parameters? And we wrote it right before the Gaia satellite because we thought the Gaia satellite would come along and completely revolutionize our understanding. But it did in, in ways that we didn't expect. Um, and one of those is that the, the spiral arms in our galaxy have lots of spurs. It's not like you've got these beautiful, clean arms. These arms are all broken up with lots of spurs. I'm sure of that now. So because it's so much more complicated, we haven't yet, no one yet has managed to do a proper reconstruction because we're living amongst all these spurs and filaments. So it's, it's going to be very difficult. But it's, it might look something like the thing on the, uh, on the, on the right-hand side or, or even on the left-hand side. The left-hand side may be more accurate because we now know that there are tidal structures coming off the Milky Way and the Milky Way has been bashed around by various impacts. So maybe it's the left-hand side image, which is more representative of what the Milky Way looks like, not the right-hand side. So it's a debate as to whether it's organized like this or whether it's a bit of a mess like that. 
And I think we're gonna have to, I think you can be sure that in the next five years, our image of what the Milky Way really looks like from outside is gonna change quite dramatically. Um, that's, the, that's what you get with new satellites. So this is a big story, like how do we figure out what is the Milky Way, what does it look like? And then my story today is part of that. In fact, it's not just that we don't know what it looks like, we don't even know what's going on. In other words, we're now detecting large waves and corrugations and strange patterns that we never knew existed before. Okay, so I've got a couple of technical slides. Here's one of them. Freeman Dyson, who was a very brilliant, famous physicist at Princeton, died a year or so ago, uh, wrote a book called Birds and Frogs. And in that book, he says that James Bradley, who was the inventor of, I suppose, modern astrometry, laid the foundations of modern science. His impressively precise astronomical measurements gave birth to experimental physics as we know it today. So he's saying that sort of essentially 200 years ago, James Bradley began to do differential measurements, measuring something with respect to something else, like a star pattern here against a star pattern there. And he would say that these stars are known accurately here, so these ones over here can be measured with respect to the accurate stars. So this measurement, precise measurement of a star's position, came to be known as astrometry. It has three parts to it. So I'll go through this relatively quickly because I don't want to dwell on it. Um, first of all, Edmund Halley realized that a star has what's called a proper motion. Now, it used to be propre, the French word. It's not proper as in the right motion. It's not what it means. Proper originally was a French word, which meant the property of, property that something has, not, not the correct motion, because the correct motion is something completely different, So I'll get to. So proper motion was an English corruption of a French word, uh, proper motion, uh, which is that the stars appear to have, be doing their own thing on the sky in projection. And then James Bradley came along with more, very much more accurate methods. He was the first scientist, apparently, to publish with four significant figures. And he detected the fact that stars' positions are shifted because they're moving at the constant speed of light. And that shift, uh, that shift is, is, is because of the, uh, the finite nature of the speed of light. Then this mutation of the Earth is wobbling around. So there's all sorts of horrible things going on that affect the way in which we perceive the stars' positions and motions. And then along came the simplest one of all, uh, Friedrich Bessel. Uh, in fact, other scientists before him had said that there would be a thing called parallax. Parallax is holding your finger up, blinking with your left eye and your right eye, and seeing the background move around. And that's the, what, the same effect you get as the Earth goes around the sun. As you look at the stars, stars, the nearby stars appear to shift left, right, uh, because of the, like, like blinking with your, uh, your eyes on your finger, uh, as the Earth goes around the sun, the star patterns all around the sky appear to shift left, right. Now that parallax can be measured now for, for hundreds of millions of stars because we have a satellite that can do that with, with measure those little shifts because of our motion around the sun uh, with, with much more accuracy. So there are lots of ideas there. There's a thing called proper motion, aberration, mutation, parallax. So this whole idea of astrometry is a very complex field. How do you measure the true motion of a star on the sky, uh, given that we're wobbling around, the Earth is wobbling around the sun, the Earth is being pulled around by the moon, uh, the Earth itself wobbles around as well like a spinning top, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a very complex mathematical science behind, but from how you go from measurements to what's really going on on the sky. And that field is called astrometry. So here's the kind of thing that you see. A star is moving through the universe and we see this effect on the sky. And that, as, and the star's moving uh, across the, 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 the field of stars, of course, by itself. But this, this effect here is parallax. The fact that we're going around the sun it's as if the star is going around and around and around, but of course it isn't. We're the one that are going around and around, and the star's position is moving. So um, proper motion has some, some other aspects to it, just to mention this quickly. So here we are on Earth. We're looking at a star far away. The proper motion is this projected motion. It's not the real motion. It's not the true property of the star. It's the projected motion on the sky. And what's going on there is the star is moving like this. And in projection, we see this part of it on the sky, the physical angle change. And this is the radial velocity, the fact that there's a redshift, blue shift. If the star's moving towards you, it's blue shifted. Away from you, it's red shifted. So a combination of the spectral radial velocity and a combination of its proper motion gives us the true velocity of the star. So this, is, this, this requires spectroscopy to see a redshift, blue shift. And this requires a satellite that can measure tiny changes in the positions of stars with respect to the background. So as you can imagine, this is an enormously complex field and the field has improved <laughs> hugely uh, in terms of how it works. 
Um, and it's gone through a whole other revolution recently with what's called gravity. This is one of the most remarkable experiments in all of astronomy today. The four VLTs, very large telescopes, they only get, this only ever happens in bright time when the moon is up. Um, they are used in the infrared to combine beams um, using what's called astrophotonics. They use fibers and waveguides. Light comes into the four telescopes. The signals are then all mixed together. And with the mixed signal, they're able to do astonishingly accurate um, um, astrometry. They can measure the positions of stars moving, would you believe, every single day in the galactic center, which I think is an astonishing achievement. So th this now is like radio astronomy. When you combine signals of many radio telescopes, you get an interference pattern. You don't have to analyze it mathematically and you, to get the image. So the point spread function, what, what a single point would look like, looks like this. It's a real mess. A typical field with many point sources looks like this. They then do sort of mathematical tricks. If you're an engineer, you will have heard of Fourier transforms, and they use all kinds of Fourier transform mathematical tricks, and they end up with a clean image, which looks like that. And they do that for every single exposure, again and again and again and again. And this method, they're able to see stars moving in the center of our galaxy every day, which is you know 28,000 light years away, and you can see stars moving daily. So, and here's here's an example of what what they what they did recently. This is right ascension on the sky and declination on the sky. These are projected on the sky coordinates. The black hole is in here somewhere. It's about here somewhere, I think, or here about here. And these are measurements um, whenever they had a chance to measure. So in April they got those measurements. This is star called S two, and then in May they got those measurements, and then in uh, uh, what, what month was that? That must have been June. And in June, they got those measurements. And this incredible track where you can see an individual star moving daily, they figured out the star was zipping past the black hole at 8,000 kilometers per second. That's way, way faster than the sun. Um, the sun would be more like 240 kilometers per second. So it looks a factor of 40 or 30 times slower. And, and then they what they did was get this measurement. And the gray line is what you get from Newton's laws. In other words, you just got a satellite moving past another body, and that's Newton's laws. And what they noticed was as the star went by the black hole, it did this. And the red curve is the prediction from Einstein's uh, general theory of relativity. So basically what happened was as the star zipped by the black hole, it was moving through a, a stretched piece of space-time, and you need Einstein's laws to solve the equation of motion. So that, that was another demonstration uh, of Einstein's laws. And as you probably know, the Nobel Prize was awarded uh, to Andrea Gers from UCLA, Reinhard Genzel uh, from G Max Planck, Germany, and Roger Penrose in Oxford. Uh, probably, probably the very, very best confirmation we've ever had of a, of a black hole. So astrometry, and this is just showing you that astrometry has come a long way. We, we measure things on not just arc second scales or milli arc second scales or micro arc second scales, but we're pushing down to, well, attempting to push below one micro arc second, uh, which is, you know, just astonishing. Okay, so let me end up with one summary just to show you how precision has come a long way. In my review, I said that the distance of the galactic center was 8.2 kiloparsecs plus or minus 0.1. So that's an error of... Um, uh, presumably about, you know, sort of a, 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 few, a few percent anyway. The black hole mass is four times 10 to the six, 4.2 plus or minus 0.2, 10 to the six. So basically four million times the mass of our sun. And the sun's circular velocity was 248 kilometers per second. But in fact, esogravity came along and has reduced all of these to much better than, much less than 1%. We now know the distance of the galactic center to incredible precision. That's something like 0.1% or better. Um, black hole mass we know to um, uh, 1%. And we know the sun's speed around the galactic center to, to better than 1% 1, 1 as well. So you can see now that precision measurement is made possible by these amazing uh, experiments. But it's not just the, uh, the ground-based experiments. There's lots of experiments in space going on right now. There's the ESA Gaia satellite, the NASA Kepler satellite, and the NASA TESS satellite. Uh, these are measuring uh, different things. ESA Gaia is measuring this astrometry stuff, how things are moving. NASA Kepler and NASA TESS are measuring how stars are flickering, uh, how much the light is flickering. Uh, and that flickering light tells you about the, uh, the mass of the star, the age of the star, and so on. 
So we're getting really good masses, really good ages for billions of stars. We're getting really good motions, six dimensional, three in position, X, Y, Z, and V, X, V, Y, V, Z, and three in velocity, three in position. So we're ending up with many more dimensions of data for a billion stars than we used to have. It's been a spectacular success. This again is pointillism. It's not a photograph. Each point uh, probably represents about a thousand stars. So that image was put together from individual measurements of individual stars. So when you put them back together again on the sky, you physically see, as you can see now with incredible detail, the Milky Way, the center of our galaxy, uh, and you even see where this ex extinction is high because of nearby dust. I think that's a particularly beautiful reconstruction of what uh, the sky looks like. So you've just got so many stars. You don't need you don't need a camera with pixels now. You've got so many stars. Every pixel is accounted for by a thousand stars. All right. Um, I'm not sure why I threw this image in, but uh, uh, well, it must, must have been a reason. I've forgotten. Okay, so this is the ESA Gaia satellite. This has revolutionized our field completely. This was sent out to where the James Webb is long before James Webb, 2013. And it's the Lagrangian point um, called L2, about a million miles away. And the satellite was sent out. And what it does is as the sun, as the Earth goes around the sun, this Lagrangian point is a, is a saddle point of stability. And the satellite can, for very inexpensively, you know, with not much fuel being used, goes round and round and round, looking away from the sun, away from the Earth. And as the Earth tracks around the sun, it covers the whole sky. So this is the satellite Gaia uh, that is uh, measuring these amazing, uh, accurate, amazingly accurate positions of stars. All right. Okay. So let's go to the next one. So this rather, this is a, this is a lovely plot, but it's very low resolution. That shows you how astrometry has improved. So Hipparchus, apparently, I'm not sure if it's true, measured the positions of a thousand stars back in, you know, uh, uh, B BC, hundreds of years before Christ. And he measured positions to an accuracy of a thousand arc seconds. A uh, thousand arc seconds, as you know, is not very good. It's, uh, it's um, well, it's 60 arc seconds to an arc minute. So that's uh, uh, like a, a third of a degree or maybe maybe a little bit better than a third of a degree, which is not very good. Because when you, as you know, when you hold your hand up, your your fist is like five degrees wide, so it's sort of like the, the size of one of your knuckles or something. Not particularly good, but anyway, he measured the, uh, the positions of a thousand stars. So that's a thousand arc seconds, and you can see what happened with time. Tycho Brahe got you down below a hundred arc seconds. Flamsteed ten arc seconds. This, uh, Scan this uh, what is he? I forget now. Swedish? I can't remember. One of the northern Scandinavian countries. Uh, he he would be a, a one arc second, and then in time. When I was a graduate student, I worked on this FK5 survey. Sorry, as an undergraduate, I should say. I came out to the Royal Greenwich Observatory, uh, which got me into my PhD uh, program. And they, my job was, as a computer scientist, before I was an astronomer, was to, was to work on this FK5, which was only at 0.1 arc second for each star, getting a position to each star to 0.1 arc second. But as the years went by, US Naval Observatory got below a milli arc second. Hipparchos satellite from Europe got up, uh, got to about the same level. And now Gaia, here we are down at the level of 10 micro arc seconds, and even today below that to about a micro arc second. So you can see that as, as the decades and centuries went by, our ability to measure the positions of stars has improved enormously. And this has had a major impact on astronomy. So today, we don't just measure positions, like where are you in X, Y, Z. We also measure velocities. So we, we, I could say VX, VY, VZ, but we actually use what are called cylindrical coordinates. VZ is the motion, the speed of motion up and down. Z is, uh, is perpendicular to the, the plane of the Milky Way. R is radius. That's the position in radius or the velocity in radius. And phi is this angle, azimuth or angle that takes you around the Milky Way. So VZ, VR, V phi are uh, completely typical uh, coordinates to use in mass, physics, engineering, and so forth. Um, and we measure VZ, VR, V phi, or VX, VY, VZ, it doesn't really matter, and X, and O, and Y, and Z, the positions that measure all six of those, we call that phase space. Three dimensions of space, three dimensions of velocity is called a phase space. So we measure phase space, six dimensions phase space coordinates with incredible accuracy. In fact, it's so good that you can now go to a star like the sun and say, what's the star actually doing over billions of years? And the orbit might look like what you see along here, the blue, the blue tracks. You can actually show that over the course of, say, 10 orbits, it's got this rather lovely rosette pattern. 
and then this red track is the last say 10 million years so we have a very accurate way now of figuring out the precise orbits of each star and you've got this for a billion stars not just one star i mean the truth is it's not that good for most of them 30, 33 million stars have extremely good orbits and the other billion stars the orbits aren't so good but they're statistically good but not so good in terms of precision so we do have there's 33 million stars that have very good orbits right now which is a lot and we also measure their spectra we measure what's in them we measure the existence of argon calcium carbon helium hydrogen and so on um and so the 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 Gaia survey is not so good at doing spectroscopy uh, like this we we but we use like ground-based machines to do the follow-up spectroscopy the u.s has one called the apogee survey i have one here called the galar survey in australia and we're busily measuring uh, for a small fraction of the stars the detailed chemistry within those stars so there's a lot of data you've got positions you've got velocities you've got ages you've got masses and you've now got uh, chemistry for millions of stars so here's my survey here in australia working with a fabulous young team the Galar survey. Galar stands for galactic archaeology. And if you've not been, the observatory is beautiful. It's, a, it's on an old, worn down volcano. Uh, and and you will realize that having so many trees is not good because it means the weather is, uh, they get rain, <laughs> which is not, you, you, you would know that a desert side is probably better. However, we do do a lot of uh, beautiful astronomy. Uh, and this is one of these machines that we use. It's, it positions fibers with little glass prisms on the end. And each glass prism deflects light from the sky into a fiber and that fiber takes it down to a spectrograph so this is how we get millions of uh, spectra for stars all right so um let's now talk for a moment i can just pause for a moment and see if people are still uh, awake are there any questions at this point it's gone quiet so i presume well um let me let me allow people to unmute themselves and uh, you, you can turn your microphones back on and ask questions at this point if you'd like or, ch or just ch uh, send a message to the chat window that's the other the other option okay yep all right so i'll carry on because this, the story start that was that was the introduction the story actually starts now <laughs> so and i get to tell you the story about what we've discovered with the Gaia satellite okay so You've probably seen these sorts of simulations in planetaria. This is by Chris Mijos in the US and working with a colleague of his, Lars Hernquist at Harvard. And they show how when you collide galaxies together, you get these beautiful interactions. These are computer simulations. These are very much out of date now. These are very early, early versions of simulations. Today, we can do many more particles, much more sophistication. But it does get across the fact that when galaxies interact, and you probably will recognize this as the antennae or the mice. There are lots of examples of galaxies that look like this on the on the sky. Um, okay, so that's one of them. Oh, why won't it let me move forward? There we are. So here's an example of galaxies that have been strongly disturbed, and their disks have been distorted into uh, wave-like structures. And and there are lots of examples of these sorts of things in the sky. So we know that galaxies are heavily impacted. Sometimes you don't see what's doing it. Often you do see what's doing it, like a luminous galaxy plopping through. Other times you don't. So the, there's a thought that maybe you've got like dark matter, things which are pure dark matter or something else falling through, things that you can't see. So it's kind of interesting um, as to what causes these. Um, now, M33 or triangulum, you'll know that well from the Northern Hemisphere. That's a, a small spiral compared to the Milky Way and Andromeda M31. Um, and that's a, it's a rather beautiful pinwheel galaxy. Uh, if you look at it in the radio, however, so that optical image I just showed you falls inside here. It sort of falls on this scale, on this, this sort of physical scale. It's a small disk right in the middle there. That's the optical image. But in the radio, the radio gas, the gas emission goes much, much further out. And we know for a fact that it's distorted heavily. It's one of the most distorted galaxies in the nearby universe. So the optical disk looks flat, but the radio emission, so the optical disk is just, is just that part there in the middle, those, those inner three rings. But in gas, if you look at hydrogen gas, you find the hydrogen gas goes much further out and it has this heavy warp in it uh, that looks like this. So we've known that for a very long time. So even uh, a uh, triangulum is very, very heavily distorted 
in its gas disk uh, by its interaction with Andromeda M31. And for that reason, we know that dark matter halos are also heavily distorted. Even though we can't see dark matter halos, we infer their presence. Um, and we know they're like a wobbling jelly. So dark matter halos, they're not these big spheres. They're probably flattened somewhat. And they're probably very distorted. This, this may be exaggerated, but so the dark matter halos are wobbling around and look very distorted, maybe highly structured. Uh, even though we can't see them, we're pretty sure that's true. Okay, so how do we learn about the Milky Way? How do we know, learn, look for um, effects of disturbance in our own Milky Way? How would we do that? Well, one way of doing that is to look at, a, let's take a, a galaxy that looks like the Milky Way from outside, like this one, seen edge on. What you could do, for example, is so take this image, and there's, there's lots of stuff, you, as you know, when you contrast images, there's lots of stuff here that's not being seen. There's probably stars up here, stars down here. So imagine you take half the galaxy image above and fold it over and subtract it from half the image below. So you take pixels in here, subtract from pixels in here, pixels in here, subtract from pixels in here, pixels in here, subtract from pixels in here. And then just do a mirror symmetry subtraction. What would that look like? So people have done that for the Milky Way in the last decade, and they learned something really amazing. So this is the Sloan survey in the Panstar, this is the Sloan survey in, the, in, um, uh, in uh, Arizona, isn't it? And Panstars in Hawaii. So they looked at all the star counts above and below the Milky Way disk. This is our, our Milky Way plane in here. And this is looking on the sky between 60 and 180 degrees in longitude, so away from the galactic center. Um, and the galactic center is over here somewhere subtract the north and the south they did that and what they found this is now folded so you've now gone so before we had minus 2.5 kiloparsecs to 2.5 kiloparsecs and they subtracted that image folded it and subtracted from that so now so now this is zero to 2.5 so it's been stretched by a factor of two and what you see is if they were completely symmetric i think you'd agree it would be green everywhere it would just be zero because it would just be a mirror, mirror symmetry of each other. But in fact, that's not what you see. You, you find regions, so right and in the plane in here, that's been removed uh, because it's too crowded and you can't separate stars. But you see regions here where there's, there's fewer stars, and then regions through here where there are more stars, then fewer stars, then more stars. It's like a ripple effect through the Milky Way disk itself. It's also true of motions. Like if we look at the random motions of stars, this is zero again. This is now in radius, eight to 10 kiloparsecs in radius, right through where we live. And you subtract the motions of stars. If, if it was a purely a motion of, it should just purely be a disk in rotation. But when we subtract the north from the south, we see again, these sorts of residual variations. It's slightly negative above, slightly positive below. So um, even in motions, not just in densities, we're seeing uh, that these things don't subtract. There are, there are real, very large scale variations going on. So this is now on a much bigger scale. This is tomography of the Milky Way. This is done by the Sloan survey, Urich and colleagues. And the galactic centers over here, there's zero, zero zeros over here. So the galactic centers over here, and this is an exponential disk. And what they've surveyed is this region in the Northern hemisphere, this region in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, and when they subtract off this model, the very clean exponential disk model, from that, they end up with these residuals across the sky. You've got too many stars, zero, blue is too few stars. Um, and they've done that, um, what the, so below, they've done it again for, oh, this is for, that's right, this is for blue stars, this is for red stars, stars which look a bit older, like giants. And you, you see different patterns in the old stars compared to the younger stars. So there are real variations between North and Southern Hemisphere in the Milky Way. And that's a real puzzle. Well, we've known about distortions of the Milky Way for a very long time. Colin Gum, who's an Australian Swiss astronomer, uh, wrote three very important papers. Uh, unfortunately, they were published uh, after he was killed in a skiing accident in 1960. And, but his work lives on. Um, this is a modern survey now. This is 2019 using classical Cepheid variable stars using the Y survey. And what you see here, if you notice, it's been stretched vertically. This is two to minus two kiloparsecs, this is 20 to minus 20. So it's been stretched vertically by about a factor of 10. But in gas and stars, we find that our own Milky Way has this rather beautiful integral sign, this rather beautiful S-shaped distortion. So we know now 
in the outer gas and in the inner stars uh, that the Milky Way actually shows signs of being distorted. But it's exaggerated here, just to make the point clear. So Heidi Newberg, um, uh, she's an American astronomer. She, I, I give her most of the credit, actually, I, I think, in terms of the one that really brought home to me and to others that there was something going on here. So what, remember how I showed you that ripple effect, north-south subtraction, you could see that there were a blue ripple and a red ripple and so on. So what she argued was, what was going on was the disk isn't flat, and that you've got these waves in the galactic, galactic plane. Now here's the sun, here's the galactic center, and as you look outwards, the star counts go above the disk, and then below the disk, and then above the disk. And she said the ripple effects, like if you look at stars nearby, the ripple goes above the plane, Look at stars further away, the ripple goes below the plane. Look at stars even further away, stars go above the plane. Maybe this becomes part of the warp later, further out. So Heidi Newberg was inferring the presence of ripples in the star counts, as if there was some kind of wave or, or like ripples on the a pond. There were some sort of ripples propagating through the Milky Way disk. And she had various goes at this in terms of artistry. I don't think any of them are are spot on in terms of what we know now with the Gaia satellite, but but they they were they were very they were very instructive, and so she suggested that maybe these ripples that we're seeing are somehow related to possibly the spiral arms. They're sort of somehow the spiral arms uh, are somehow involved in this process, and that maybe the ripples are moving with the spiral arms or something like that. Um, other people came along and said, could the ripples be doing this? Well, this is complete nonsense. This, this can't happen. You can't have ripples propagating through the disk like that because these, this disk is not a solid piece of steel. It's actually differential, like water down a plug hole. Like this is moving fast. This is moving like rapidly around here. And this is moving slower around the disk. So it's not, that could not be the picture. Now, other people have come along more recently uh, and said, actually, if you look at the star formation regions, they go above the plane below the plane and above the plane. And, um, and he took a cut through the Milky Way disk like this, looking in this direction through this. We're now looking above. This is the Orion here. This is the sun's position here. This is plus or minus two kiloparsecs. This is looking at XY above, above the Milky Way plane. Sorry, it should be clearer. This is galactic latitude versus longitude. So we're looking at the Milky Way from the side in a sense, but we're living inside of it, which makes it difficult. And uh, this is looking from above. And so he takes this line through here and finds there's some kind of ripple effect in the star formation regions. And in fact, he selects certain star formation regions and says, look at that, I see a clear ripple. But I've never kind of fully understood how those regions were selected. But he talks about, this is all in gas now, not stars. He says, hot, uh, star forming regions show evidence of these ripples in the local gas. So you've got stellar ripples seen by Heidi Newberg, and you've got gas ripples seen by uh, uh, Dr. Alves. So anyway, um, in terms of where we are looking, um, so let me show you this. Yeah, I'll, I'll speed this up. So in his video for, for, for his paper, he starts at Harvard. I thought that was interesting. Somehow we went from Harvard to this wave. I'm not sure what that relevance is, but I thought it was rather cute. Um, so as you go out past the sun, the nearest stars, I'm moving as quick as I can to show you where it is. You go out into the Milky Way disk. Here we go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. And then he's showing you where that ripple is there. And I think that I'll let that run now. And I think that's the ripple of star forming regions in the gas. There's the sun there. And so the ripple, the wave goes right over our head, apparently, if you believe this, this particular study. So even though stars are being born in these clouds, these, these clouds really show you where the dense gas is. So I'm saying that the ripples are being seen in gas as well as in the old stars seen by Heidi Newberg. Okay, so that's, I thought that was rather fun. Um, and it turns out that you probably remember G Gould's belt. I'm sure this is a, a thing that I know astronomers love what, looking at. Uh, there's a belt of uh, star forming regions um, in this inclined plane. This inclined plane appears to be part of this, this, local, this local ripple. If you could see what it looks like, if you were living outside the Milky Way, it would look something like this. It'd be a ripple that goes over our heads and down again. So maybe Gould's belt is sort of is is a tilted structure in here on on that uh, on that ripple. Okay, so these corrugations are seen in nearby galaxies. If you look very carefully in dust, and you could do your own deep imaging to see if you agree with this, 
you see this rather interesting up and down effect in nearby disks. And if you measure, if you measure that accurately in terms of the dense clouds, you do really do see a ripple, a, a corrugation effect. Uh, and, and there's been, I don't know, 20 or 30 galaxies now where these ripple effects are seen. So it's a really interesting question, what triggers these waves? You know, where they come from, how long do they last? And we're seeing them uh, in the Milky Way. Some of these ripples are spectacular. This was done by John Conmondy and colleagues, um, my colleagues at Kentucky, I can't remember their names now, but many years ago they, they did this work and you saw this beautiful, very, very strong ripple in dust. And dust presumably shows you where the dense gas is. So you, you can think of it as being where the dense gas is. But there's this incredible, um, this disk has been incredibly uh, disrupted by some enormously powerful passing event. Uh, so this, I, I would call this a tsunami. It's a particularly uh, disastrous, <laughs> particularly uh, extreme example of these ripples. All right, so let me now show you uh, what we're learning. I'll keep this very brief, but it's qu quite fantastic what comes out of this. So my, my colleague, Torsten uh, Tepe Garcia, his uh, colleague here in the University of Sydney, spent many years running these dynamical models. And this is what the Milky Way looks like from above um, in pure stars, if you don't disturb it. And this is what it looks like. So this is X and Y. This is X and Z and Y and Z. So you're seeing it from side on in two different directions here and here. Now, what Torsten showed is what happens to that disk if you, it's the first of its kind really, because it's a, it's a pure impulse. It's not having like Chris Mihos had two disks wide and it gets very, very messy. What Torsten did, uh, people have done this kind of work, but not in the way that Torsten did. Torsten, what he did was drop uh, a heavy object through this disk and then made the heavy object go away, basically to fade away so that you have a true impulse. Oh, sorry, I didn't, it didn't work. Let me try again. So now it's the same thing with a heavy object passing through and it triggers. And this is, this is very meaningful because what it does is trigger a beautiful spiral pattern that unfolds in a very clean way. And, and that's really interesting because there are people that believe, as I do, that the spiral arms that we do have in the Milky Way have been triggered by an event like this. That the spiral arms that formed us, the five spiral arms that made the sort of neighborhood, the sun, the planets, that these spiral arms that we have were triggered by a passing object. That may seem heretical, but it isn't. I think most people, or maybe half of astronomers in this field would agree with that. They might disagree with details. Um, but let me show you that again. It doesn't, so it goes through, bang. That, in fact, let me show you that again. It's the white object, that little white fleck. That's the center of a massive object that goes through and triggers these spiral arms. Now, if you also notice, there are ripples in the plane itself. Let me show you that again. Again, Look at the ripples that occur in the plane, starting about now. The ripples get stronger and stronger. They become well pronounced. You see the ripples there? So it doesn't just drive spiral arms, it also drives ripples. And these spiral arms live with these ripples. So I think this is a large part of what we're seeing. Okay, let me move on and show you what, where this takes us. That's the wrong way, sorry. So, um, so what we did was to analyze both arms. The blue arm is one arm, the red arm is the other arm. And we actually watch how these arms unfold over millions of years. That's 380, 476, 571, 666, 761, 856, 951. So over the course of a billion years, we're showing you how the arms wrap up, um, triggered by this event coming through. Okay. So, so um, remember one thing to go back a second, that this rotation, the speed of motion around the orbit on average is about the same. It's moving at 240 kilometers per second everywhere. But to get around this circle, that circle is a shorter distance than that circle moving at the same speed. And what it means is the inner stuff is moving faster than the outer stuff. So it's all moving at the same speed along its orbit, but it's going around in angle faster, the angular frequency is. So if, if I was to run that and show you, so that's sort of like a, a model for what, what the flat rotation curve is doing. So everywhere, this stuff is moving at the same speed, but it has to go further to do one circuit of the central hole. So it's sort of it's what we call differential rotation. Now that's really important in terms, of, in terms of what you get, what happens. So basically what that means is, I don't think we're seeing ripples on a pond. 
in when you look at these ripples, because these ripples get sheared by the fact that if you had to sort of imagine these ripples occurring on that previous whirlpool, it's a combination of the both of them, and that gives you some very strange effects. So I think Heidi's cartoon is probably right. We've got ripples which are near the spiral arms, but not on the spiral arms. And there's a real distinction here, which I think is consistent with what we see in the Milky Way. Let me show you. So the thing to be aware of, which is really wild, okay, it's not just the spiral arms that are wrapping up in time, it's also the ripples. So imagine you've got a disc that starts with plus, you know, white is above the plane and black is below the plane. So it goes above the plane, below the plane, above the plane, below the plane. You've got to combine it with that differential effect from the whirlpool, remember the whirlpool video? And that means the inside ripple is wrapping up faster than the outside ripple. So then after a certain length of time, 10, these are arbitrary units, it wraps up and 55, it wraps up more, 70 wraps up even more. After T equals 100, that's 10 times further in time than that one, it's wrapped up a lot. So the spiral arms are wrapping up, but also the ripple is wrapping up as well. Imagine that, which is wild. The difference, however, is the ripple wraps up at a different rate from the spiral arms. And that's a really important distinction. So spiral arms are wrapping up at certain speed, angular rate, but the ripple is wrapping up at exactly, almost exactly half the rate. So the spiral arms go up and down, up and down as the ripples move under them. So that's that's that was really quite extraordinary. It turns out there are theoretical papers going back many years about Russians and you know and so forth uh, talking about this is the sort of thing that would happen if you bang a galactic disk. You know, if you just bash it, then these are the sorts of effects that happen. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing. So we call this the roller coaster. And here's the, here's the object that did it, by the way. It's called the Sagittarius dwarf. This heavy object um, has been through the Milky Way several times already. It's coming through again. And this was discovered actually in, in Australia on the, uh, the Anglo-Australian telescope that I showed you early on. This, this object was discovered, but this has been mapped by many surveys since. It's a dwarf galaxy. It, it was once the mass of the large Magellanic, Magellanic cloud, which is 10% of the mass of the Milky Way. It was once that massive. Now it's only 1% of the mass of the large Magellanic, Magellanic cloud. And it's punching because it's lost a lot of its mass as, as it gets destroyed. And it's punching through the Milky Way. So I think that's the trigger for what's causing it. And, and proof of that, if you like, is as follows. Here's the Gaia satellite, which does this astrometry. It measures stars in that direction compared to stars in that direction with a very accurately measured angle. It's beautiful engineering in this spacecraft. And what they're seeing now is the Milky Way has this large-scale warp on it in the outer stars, but it also has ripples inside of it. And these ripples are seen in this plot. Now, it's kind of weird. I'll just, let me just mention this very quickly. It gets called the snail. So Z is the motion above and below the plane of the Milky Way. So Z, so that, that's going above the plane, that's going below the plane. This is motion. This is motion above the plane, moving at speed above the plane, moving at speed below the plane. So if you, have a, if you had a, an oscillator, like a pendulum swinging backwards and forwards like this, that would purely make a circle in this in this drawing. If you, if you had Z, and, you know, v, Z is the this distance, VZ is the motion, then it turns around, Z is the distance, VZ is the motion. It's the pendulum doing this and this and this. If you were to plot that on that diagram, it would be a circle. And then if that pendulum began to uh, damp, damp, but began to stop swinging, like it swings like this, then like this, and then like this, and then like this, and then stops, that circle would become a spiral. As, a, as the pendulum. So what you're seeing here is basically 33 million stars, which were moving above and below the disk as a pendulum. And some of them are still going uh, way out here and some are slowing down and some have stopped in the middle. And you basically got all these stars going up and down, up and down nearby, and, and it's all in our neighborhood. And it makes this amazing spiral, this spiral in the Z, VZ phase space. We call this the snail. It's the great discovery of the Isa Gaia satellite. All the local stars are, are sloshing up and down like different pendula with different swings. Some are going a long way in and out, some are going only a small distance, which is proof that the galaxy was bashed by some passing object. All right, so this is my last technical slide, then I have a summary slide. This is from our model now, just to prove the fact. So here's the spiral wrapping up, and green means it's above the plane, pink means it's below the plane. And look what happens. 
This model shows you the spiral arm is below the plane, spiral arms above the plane, spiral arms below the plane, spiral arms above the plane, and the same with the other arm, the counter arm is the same thing. And if you do that, if you look in different volumes of this, of the spiral arm, because the spiral arm is going up and down because of the bending mode below it, that, the thing that's wrapping up below it, the, that wave corrugation. And if you then look at the stars in those regions, you see these beautiful spirals. So this is the this is Z against VZ. So we generate, we show that stars going up and down like this give you these net, these spirals that, that you see from the Gaia satellite over here. So that's rather, I, I know it's a lot to take in when you first see it. It really is a lot to take in. Um, but basically we're seeing millions of pendula going up and down, up and down in our volume uh, because the spiral arms are being pushed in up and down by these bending modes. And all of this was triggered by the disc being punched by something passing through. Okay, to finish up. The amazing thing is, Ruiz Lara and colleagues have come along and said, maybe this is the origin of the solar system, which is amazing, if true. Something punched through our disk, drove these spiral arms, drove these bending modes, these corrugations, and, and as far as we can tell from the orbit of Sag, as when it first went through, it did go through about 5 billion years ago. So if you allow for the collapse time of a cloud and so on and so forth, and there really was a spike of star formation at that time when it first went through, we know that the, the, this diagram I just showed you is probably, let me show that again. This is probably correct because we know the star formation history independently of, of anything and it around 5 billion years ago. And that's when we formed. So it may be we formed when there was a burst of star formation because when Sag went through the disk, it drove lots of gas clouds to collapse and form stars. So it's rather exciting that this all these spiral arms wrapping up, these bending modes and ripples, uh, waves propping, propagating through the disk, are basically a consequence of what's been happening over billions of years. And it's all because we, the disk was plunged as the Sagittarius dwarf went through uh, the Milky Way. So I think I've almost finished. Ah, so. So if I, this is what the spiral arms look like today. I think they're actually very, very messy. And this is comparing a frame from my model with the Milky Way today. You can see now how these spiral arms that we see today triggered by a model like this could account for the spiral arms that we observe on the sky today. And it certainly could account for it. And so here's my summary. So Sagittarius dwarf today is um, a billion times the mass of the sun. It turns out that's not enough to drive these waves. You need at least 10 billion. But we're pretty confident the story is correct because we know these waves last billions of years and we know the Sagittarius dwarf was once about the mass of the LMC. It was 100 times more massive. We're only seeing 1% of what's left. This, we're just seeing the center of it. The rest of it's been stripped off. And the reason we know that is because of the, of the, of the metallicities of the stars that in the center of that galaxy have the same as the metallicities of the stars in the center of the LMC. So we're pretty sure that thing was once 100 times more massive. So basically what we're seeing is a very ancient relic of what happened uh, over the last few billion years. And maybe an earlier crossing is what triggered the formation of the sun, which I think is a really lovely idea and it's entirely plausible. Um, and to end up by saying that we've got so much more to learn. This is a field we call galactic seismology, looking at how the disk responds to impulses. Um, and there are lots of surveys that will be delivering new data, even more stars, more accurate data over the next few years. And hopefully this story will uh, will teach us more about what we what we do or don't know, particularly about dark matter. What is dark matter doing in the halo at the same time? Thank you very much. Josh, thank you. That, I, that, that um, got to think about all of that for a little while, but let me ask if uh, if there are questions. It's pretty wild. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and oh. beats. we're open for questions. Stun silence. Hello, hello. No, I have a question. Yep. Uh, when, I'm not sure I understood the, the very end here. Um, suppose the Sagittarius dwarf has some sort of a halo of dark matter. Wouldn't that give it the extra mass that it needs to trigger these events? Mike, that's a fantastic question. You should be in my graduate group. Brilliant. In fact, that's what I'm saying, that it did have that, uh, and it lost it. it lost See, Sagittarius Dwarf, if you look at, do you remember that video? Let me, let me show you my video again, because that was done by a different group, and I think the, the video is correct. I, I would say the video is correct. Let me go back. Um, so I go to display mode. Can you see that still? Yeah. 
And yeah. let me stop it as we go. That there's Sagittarius dwarf, and it was once had a massive dark matter halo. Okay. Um, but then as it came through, it crossed six billion years ago and it lost probably about 20% of its mass. And then it went out and got distorted. And it came through again and it lost probably half of its mass at this point. That was about uh, three billion years ago. And it came through again. And as it gets nearer to the center of the galaxy, it's losing mass at a faster rate. So only the nucleus survives. So to answer your question, you're entirely correct. It does have a dark matter halo, but it's lost it. Through the separate crossings of the Milky Way disk, it, it's you, we, this stuff gets stripped. So that dark matter of Sagittarius dwarf is now joined in the dark matter of our own galaxy. So, uh, but the mass today is the stripped nucleus of what was once unstripped. Does that make any sense? Yes, 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 yes. And I'd be yeah, happy but it's, to a, join it's your a great research. question. Sorry? I'd be happy to join your research group if you pay my <laughs> car fare. <laughs> <and expenses. laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, your perception is correct. It, it, you're saying, doesn't it have it now? In fact, actual fact, I don't think it can have it now because it's too far in. Anything which gets too far in gets stripped. Like even globular clusters, even little little things, not just big things. Everything which gets to the gradient, the tidal gradient is so enormous as you go further and further in. When you're a long way out, you're losing stuff slowly because the gradient is weak. But as you get into the center of the galaxy, you lose more and more and more. So I think it's lost most of its dark halo. Uh, let me ask a question. What accounts for the orbit of this Sagittarius dwarf? Is it orbiting the center of mass of our galaxy? Or is this just... Yeah. In fact, the whole of astrophysics is based on one simple idea uh, Chandrasekhar first talked about uh, called dynamical friction. And if, if the orbiting, you think, well, hang on, the Earth goes round the sun goes around the sun for billions of years it doesn't spiral in so why does everything i show you spiral in where does that come from it's come from the fact that these objects are extended they're not points point masses they're extended at masses and that is is the following problem imagine you've got a swarm of bees you, you, there's a massive pile of bees outside and you fire a gun through the swarm of bees the bees see the, the bullet moving towards them and they feel the gravity of the bullet and, they, and it pulls them together a little bit. And the bullet also is being pulled towards the bees through gravity. As the bullet moves through the swarm of bees, the bees are now squashed into a denser swarm of bees through gravity. And it has to climb out of a, of a denser swarm of bees. That's called, and we, that's the analogy we always use in class, that, 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 that's called dynamical friction. Whenever you have a swarm and another swarm, and the swarms move through each other, the swarms this swarm sees that swarm and it sh it shrinks it down this swarm sees that swarm shrinks it down then you're moving through a denser potential world you lose energy you lose energy to the to the other swarm as if you get what i'm saying so that's we know that's what's going on in these n-body simulations and then, in fact it's the reason the galaxies build otherwise how do all these clumps of dark matter why do they need to orbit forever why do they all merge to form a dark matter it's because of dynamical friction mm -hmm. so that's that's why the orbit um loses energy that, that, that compact object, that Sagittarius dwarf, is actually losing energy to this. It's losing mass and energy to the stars and dark matter of our own halo. And it's a huge multi-body problem. And this huge. Sagittarius dwarf is penetrating our plane in a different part every time. So it's causing some yeah. kind of an evolution. I yeah, was... absolutely. And in fact, we do these now with supercomputers. I, I'm Torsten and I use a supercomputer in Australia, the Gardi supercomputer. Americans have access to uh, Illinois as a fantastic supercomputer center. And these are very expensive calculations. Yeah. It's, it's just simple Newton's laws. It really is no more than Newton's laws. Like you've got a billion objects here and a billion objects here, or uh, sorry, a million objects here and a billion objects here. You work out all the forces by computer, supercomputer at very high speeds. It's just simple Newton's laws, not, not much more than that. Would there be some way of, um of somehow sort of sympathize, synthesizing this so you didn't have to work out every individual point. That is correct. If, if you look at how the codes work, in fact, Lars Hernquist at Harvard is a good friend of mine. I was overlapped with him at Princeton back in the late 80s, and I watched him doing this in real time. He developed a code called the tree SPH code. 
And it's a very clever way of, you don't need to work out, you've got a particle here and you've got a billion particles over here. You don't actually need to work out all the forces. You, you, you worry about the things which are near you, but as things go further and further away, you can use averages over ensembles. So they have very clever partitioning tricks. And it's the kind, it's, it's actually not so dissimilar to what Amazon.com does when it analyzes trillions of gigabytes of data on people's purchasing power <laughs> and trying to relate this to this. Do you really want to have a matrix of a billion people here and a matrix of a billion other purchases here? And, you know, there must be efficient ways of comparing matrices. And there are all sorts of clever tricks that, 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 that do that. So you, you don't, so, so that's not entirely true. There are simulators. Take a globular cluster with a million, a globular cluster with a million stars. And you're wondering about what the stars do over billions of years in a globular cluster. In that case, you do do all the calculations because you have to worry about individual stars becoming binaries and blah, blah, blah. But if you're doing galaxies and cosmology simulations, you don't have to worry about one on one. Yeah, it's, 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 there's a whole statecraft behind behind them body simulations. It's, it's a massive field. A lot of there are thousands of people doing this work across atmospheric physics and geophysics engineering calculations question since the uh, milky way is now approaching uh, and maybe even interacting with uh, andromeda aren't we about to punch andromeda and so aren't some of these things testable over a very long period of time but yeah yeah uh, yeah that's uh, that's a really interesting conversation in its own right i've done some work on this it's sort of like four billion five billion years into the future uh we and milk Andromeda, and they, some people call it Milcomeda. Milky Way crossed with Andromeda becomes Milcomeda, which I think is a stupid name. But I find if you type the word Milcomeda into Google, you'll find uh, people's work on, on that. There's a question that um, Mark's iPhone says, mapping of dark matter of the ripples. That's a super great, I don't know where Mark is. I can't see his face, but if he's here somewhere. Uh, that's a super, super idea. And in fact, um, the, we, we are quite convinced now the, the dark matter halo, we just, just think of a smooth sphere of stuff. It isn't. The dark halo has got all sorts of stuff going on. It's highly structured. It could even be cigar shaped or like a rugby ball. Or, or, um, do you have an oval ball in American sports? I can't think that you do. A rugby ball, you know, it could be, or it could be a pro um, oblate thing, um, or it could be, or it could be, and, and we, it certainly has all sorts of ripples and structure in it wakes we call it dark matter wakes and there's a lot of work coming out so in the halo we see streams i don't know if you've ever had a speaker talking about streams to you and and in the us there's some very good people like ting lee she's at uh well i think she's in canada um but Catherine johnston she's in columbia there are a lot of very impressive people who model streams of stars and there's now a hundred streams that have been found. They're thin streams of stars, which are being a, a cluster of stars, which has been disrupted into a tiny stream. These streams show clear evidence of the dark matter being complicated. You, you, the streams should just be nice and neat thing like this, like nice neat spaghetti, but they're not. They've got kinks and wobbles in them. Sometimes the streams sort of tilt and, and do weird shape things. So you should get someone like Catherine Johnston talk to you about streams in the halo. And they show that there's all sorts of dark matter wakes and ripples in dark matter going on, maybe clumps and substructure that we can't see right now, but we can infer its presence. So I think the next decade is gonna be about trying to figure out what is dark matter in terms of its, there's, there's the particle thing, like what is the particle causing it, which is like Large Hadron Collider and all these experiments in mines happening in Australia and America and all around the world. There's the particle nature of what is dark matter, but then there's the structure of it. What is it, how does it coagulate into stuff? Uh, like Milky Way, uh, that 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 second thing is what I'm heavily involved in. I've just written another paper, completely separate from this paper, um, on on dark, dark matter wakes and ripples, which will be appearing in the physics journals next next couple of months. So I think the next decade will be all about trying to figure out, you know, if you could see dark matter, what would it actually look like in terms of its distribution? It's a nice nice. Uh, Inside. Other other questions, other questions, please. There are some questions in the chat. Um, okay. I don't I see. Uh, at what speed do these ripples move, Ari? Yeah. Good. Really? 
Really interesting question. What speed do the ripples move? Um, yeah, so they, they're not moving fast. So if you remember that simulation I showed you, um, probably the best answer is it's, so they're moving much slower than the speed of the, the stars around the sun. Sorry, stars around the galactic center, the sun around the galactic center. That's moving at 240 kilometers for 250 kilometers per second. Okay, so it takes 220 million years for the sun to go right around the center of our galaxy. But these ripples are slower. They are, the way they propagate, it's sort of like, um, I saw, a, someone showed me a video of, um, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of like a watching a, a boat. It generates a wake. And you notice, and the boat's moving fast, the river can be moving fast, but the wake moves off at a much slower speed mm -hmm. away from the boat. It's sort of like that. These ripples don't care about the, the speed of the flow underneath them. They're a propagation, which is independent of the speed of the, of the medium below them. So they move quite slowly, I'd say. Oh, so thank maybe you five, five times slow. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Well, we, we've talked about spiral galaxies. Um, what's what's the origin story for elliptical galaxies? Yeah, that's um, elliptical galaxies are a mess. They are. It's claimed that they are almost anything that you smash together, like two disk galaxies or two spherical, little spherical galaxies, almost anything you smash together uh, will make you some kind of elliptical galaxy, apparently. So uh, it turns out, however, that elliptical galaxies are, are come in different kinds. There's the giant ones, which don't rotate very fast. They look like a pileup. Like if you throw lots and lots of things into the center of a group of galaxies or cluster, they make this big elliptical thing. It's a mess. Everything's just a pileup of debris. But there's also the small ellipticals, which seem to have rotation in them. So they so somehow you've collided two objects uh, of lower mass and they've preserved enough angular momentum to that the residual product is a is a pileup of a, a car crash but it's combined with a little bit of rotation that survived. So the low mass ellipticals may be different from the from the high mass ellipticals. I think the high mass ellipticals are, are, are basically a pileup of debris, lots of things falling in. Yeah. Okay. And somehow the gas gets all used up. There's not much gas left. Thank you. Have we got other questions? Anybody else? Please step in. I'm glad we got through this without being hacked this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yes, well uh, so am I. Yes. Just um, a comment here. Uh, I read from Brazil. This is one of the most fantastic talks I've attended in the last uh, several years. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always sorry that these stories, there's there's not more time. I mean, what I ha wish I'd had is more time to show some nice, simple, like uh, teaching a class in physics, I'd have nice little experiments of pendula going backwards and forwards and doing things, but um, it's just too little time. Oh, sorry, is there a question? I don't know. Am I being told off for going on for too long? Is that, is that... No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I gave a talk in Japan and the person said, thank you, more questions, more questions. And I answered, he said, now you must stop. <laughs> Halfway through my question. I was answering the question in, to a Japanese astronomer and he said, now you must stop, right in the middle of my answer. So. Let, let me ask one more, if, if we've got time. If you had started running your model of the rotation of the Milky Way galaxy and, and the Sagittarius dwarf going through it, started it without any spiral arms mm -hmm. you know but kind of a homogeneous uh and i don't know if that's even possible but if you started it that way and then had the dwarf galaxy go through on some of these passes would you reproduce the arms that we see now so are you saying start with a disc with no with no arms start with a disc with no arms have the have the sagittarius dwarf you know, penetrate the plane like you had it, would, would, would some of those passes eventually reproduce the structure we see today? Oh, actually, can I, do I have time to show you, can, can you see, can you see that? Yes. Aha, uh -huh. that's what I was saying. If I run 
this is, for a lot of reasons, this is a very good representation of the Milky Way without spiral alarms, the, the top one. Do you see? Yeah. That's, that's the disk seen from above. It's like 100 million particles. Okay. It's being evolved for about a, a billion years. And then this one is the same thing. It's the exact same galaxy. So it's this. This is this has been designed very, very carefully to have stability, as if it was the Milky Way without spiral alarms living for a billion years. And then you've now got Milky Way without spiral alarms living for a billion years. There's no gas in there either, by the way. It's pure stars. Um, but we put gas in later. So we do that again. Now we've got the same disk exactly, but this time a perturba goes through it. And that perturba generates spiral alarms that wrap up. And I'm saying that these spiral alarms look a lot like what we've got today. Right. And you also, if you look at Sidon, see these beautiful ripples. Do you see those see the ripples? I see the ripple. So does that imply that the some kind of an original state looked like this above, you know, galaxy yeah. without ours? All right. That's a really okay. Let, let me let me let me start again. If let me start again. So if we had had the Milky Way like this with yeah. arms in it, imagine we already had arms in here mm -hmm. that existed for another reason. Okay. And we hit it with an impulse, like I just showed you. Right. Um, I don't completely know what would happen, but I'm fairly certain that this would dominate. Oh, okay. You, you're raising a really, really good question because what we've done are simulations which already have a bar and spiral alarms. And we've hit that with a perturba, and it is more, it is a little bit more messy, but in fact, this impulse driven spiral arm does dominate. Yeah. So in actual fact, when you when you bash a disk, it's almost like you restart it, like you you reorganize it, resettle it, restart it. It's like so it's like year dot. So these assuming that our impulses are 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 are, are, are correct, the, the, the level of impulse we're imposing is correct. Um so I would say that this that any impulse going through the disk doesn't matter what went before it it would it would re restart the restart the from scratch <laughs> and look like this. Does that make sense? I think so. Thank you. Yeah. It's it's yeah. You, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, what I haven't shown you is what happens when you have gas in there and you know lots of molecular clouds and you know bring in an element, large small element cloud and all the other things moving around. Um, we've been doing that now, getting more and more sophisticated. And I think it still holds true that a major impulse sets everything in motion and dominates the previous, what went before. So if you had a um, something pass through an elliptical galaxy, hmm. would the result be? Something? No, no, no. A, that's a fabulous question. And the answer is no. What you, what, you, know, you, you know what you'd get in that case? Um, ah, am I allowed to bring up, um, let me, let me just find you what you're going to get. And would you believe these are being found in a nearby universe? Um, okay. Uh, can, can you see my, 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 my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to go to Google and I'm going to type in, let me show you. These were discovered in Australia by the famous photographer, David Malin, who's a colleague of mine here. Uh, he and I worked the same observatory for 20 years. He's a fantastic cello. David made him discover what are called shells, elliptical galaxies. Look at this. And um, yeah, let's see if I can find some beautiful examples of this to show you. This is what happens in your case. Oops, that's, uh, I made a mistake then. So <laughs> images. Aha, here we go. Look at this. If you have an elliptical uh, galaxy and you throw, let me, let me find a cleaner. So these are so messy these days. Um, I'm just looking for a spectacular example to show you of, of shells. I think, I think these are some of the best. Here we are. Let me, let me see if I can bring this one up. Yeah, M89, I believe, is one of the, oh, oh gosh, I, it's, so, it's so frustrating how they always give you multiple options, like, you know, going into an American restaurant, we get five choices of water and three choices of bread and six choices. <laughs> I just want a meal. <laughs> you know, I am not, uh, the choice culture drives me mad. Anyway, I find it so hard to someone like me who's indecisive. All right, here we go. So here, oh, this is not an elliptical. No, this is a spiral. Ah, okay. So this is so. It's sometimes spirals have them too, but mostly ellipticals. If you throw an object through an elliptical, you get these beautiful thin shells. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So it it um, the galaxy itself is not messed up as far as I know, but it but what happens is. 
is is people say it's like when you have a, a pig trough and you throw marbles in the marbles slush around and every now and then you see a ripple where the marbles are turning around where it slows down you see ripples occurring you know, you've got millions of marbles going back and forth in the pig trough every now and then the, mar the marbles always turn around to come back turn around to come back every now and then you see a whole bunch in in synchrony it, uh, lined up together sort of like um newton's cradle with the swinging pendulum so these shells i think are what are called if you throw a dwarf galaxy through elliptical and what confuses me however is this is a, actually a spiral in the middle which i i did not remember this this galaxy is having a spiral a disc in the middle of it all right so that wasn't so impressive <laughs> i'll stop sharing we elliptical. are Trust me when I say the ellipticals are ones that mostly have shells, almost entirely. Yeah. We are we are running down on time. Uh, okay, Kurt, let's 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 conclude. Con Curtis, you had a you had a question. You want to step in with it? Uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I'm I'm struggling with your entire presentation because it seems to fly in the face of what uh, I learned as the uh, orthodox model for spiral galaxies as it existed 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, quite right. And, and, and uh, uh, the thing is, I, I always understood that the arms of the galaxies are not winding up, that they're caused by some sort of uh, uh, waves progressing, uh, you know, I guess in a circular passion, pattern through the galaxy. And what you're saying is in fact, the arms do wind up. Yeah, well done. Well done to you. So um, <laughs> that is an entire conversation. So let your Chris, that, Curtis, your question, your comment question is spot on. So the the big breakthrough has been to realize, as you say, it used to be like this, this inc incorrect model by Lin and Chu of a spiral arms or a wave like phenomenon that never wrap up. They had this idea that maybe arms should never wrap up. There's no reason to think they should. So that that was wrong from the outset. That arms can't be winding up. Well, they can be winding up as long as they're regenerated. So we now know. I think most astronomers would agree. In galactic astronomy, like me, would agree. I'm talking about three or four hundred people. Most would agree that spiral arms are not long lived. They're transient. Spiral arms are like waves that build and crash on the beach. You see these beautiful ripples from. In you know in Hawaii you're watching these beautiful as I lived there for four years they watch these beautiful uh, swells coming and then they build up build up and crash more swells coming in build up and crash and where, spiral arms are transient they're not long lived and, now, if, and I I have been misinformed all these years and I've probably even given the wrong explanation at star parties as to what's going on in galaxies yeah I, so linen shoes linen shoes models I'm enlightened. Yeah, Lennon Shoes model is wrong. Spiral arms are, are definitely transient phenomena. And the reason we know that, which is wild, is because Selwood and Binney in 2002 wrote a paper which showed that spiral arms long lived. Stars are born in a certain place, they stay where they are. I mean, they wobble about because of their orbit. But if spiral arms are transient, stars get kicked out of their orbit and they migrate. So star radial migration is now the, is, the, it's the biggest, um, uh, it, maybe it's overhyped, but it's the biggest thing in galactic astronomy that all stars migrate. Our sun, for example, was not born at eight kiloparsecs. It was born at four kiloparsecs and migrated to eight kiloparsecs over billions of years. So our sun was once, when we were born, we were four, we were half half the distance from the galactic center. And over, over, four, over five billion, four, four and a half billion years, we've migrated all the way out to eight kiloparsecs. We probably migrate even further out. Well, that raises so questions. All, yeah, that raises questions then for uh, uh, plate tectonics and uh, seismology. No, is, the forces aren't not the right forces. They're all internal. No, I know what you're saying, but no, it well, doesn't. It doesn't. The well, wrong. no. It, well, okay, okay, okay. 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 That's a, that's again another concept. Things on Earth, the, the, the forces there. It's more to do with the moon and moon and. Yeah, don't, yeah, that's, that's separate. But what I'm saying is that every star in the Milky Way is migrating. They're not born stay. They move a long way from where they were born because of spiral arms being transient. So the fact we know them, and I, I don't get me on why we know, but we know without a shadow of a doubt that all stars are born and then they migrate a long way because everything makes sense once you see that. 
that's a whole other uh, presentation about why do stars migrate um, and go on holiday somewhere else, you know. Um, um, so my just to, just to finish very quickly, the the point I'm saying is that the the spiral alarm transients it goes goes along with that. If you make spiral alarms long live, then spiral, you can't account for all this migration. At the so, age of seventy eight, I have an epiphany. Then I'm, it I'm, is an epiphany I'm, for I'm all of us. It's, it's taken twenty years. Yeah, for twenty years, it's taken us all to realize this is what's going on. Science moves on, Curtis. Science moves on. All right. <laughs> but that yeah. theory that of the long not long 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 An epiphany. An epiphany seems like an appropriate place to bring this meeting to a close. I can't think of a more appropriate way to do it. Um, and we uh, we've. We've been been about an hour and a half, and we're running out on the time limit. And Josh, you've been well. You've been very, very generous with your time. We thank you. That was really a spectacular presentation. Um, yeah, we're very grateful. And with that, I'd like to do a quick note here on our next speaker. Um, well, we're going to skip Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Hard to get people to speak on either of those days. The next scheduled uh, date for the Greenway Talks is January 7th. And I, I admit to a certain failure right now. I contacted people and um, speak. they all said they were, on January 7th, they were headed for Seattle. And the AAS conference that begins there on the 8th. So I haven't got anybody for the 7th yet. We may later on. The next person I got scheduled is on January 21st, when Dr. Robert Korakoff will describe how his team of engineers at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory designed the optical fix that corrected the blurred vision of the Hubble Space Telescope and built the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2. Please attend this Greenway event and meet the person who is considered most responsible for saving the Hubble Space Telescope. So, thank you again, Professor Joss Bland, Hawthorne, and my thanks to all of you who came, all of you who attend these meetings and support the Greenway Talks online. With that, I'll close the meeting off. We'll see you again on January 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Great talk. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you all. And Bye -bye. a year from now, I'll talk to you about James Webb if you want. <laughs> Got a deal. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>